There are a lot of people that believe we're in the end days. I have fought this kind of thinking um, because I don't want to believe those things in Revelation will come to pass. I don't, I, it's horrendous to me. Um, and I have defended myself with the idea that symbolism in Revelation is so ambiguous that who knows what those things mean anyway. But I have been schooled in it, and there are things in Revelation, a framework, in fact, that is perfectly clear. And there are, as to whether we're in the end times, it will soon be obvious. So you don't really need my, my opinion on it. But this is going to be important to all of us, whether we are or not. This is going to be critical to all of us. What's going on right now? We are definitely going to be in a time of chaos and confusion of uh, proportion that Americans are just not used to. And other people in the world, it will spread all over. Um, and people will be turning, turning to the truth, turning to the truth of Yehovah. They'll be turning to the truth of God. And there will be a harvest, a harvest of many millions of people. It will not be the majority, but it will be a lot of people. And we need to be ready for that. We need to be armed with the truth because these people are hungry for truth. And I know when I went into the, when came back to the church, I was spiritually hungry. And I went into the church and what they offered me was this stale wafer and this tiny thimble of grape juice. You know, and that is not what Yehovah and Yeshua, his son, our savior, that's not what they have for us. That's not what they are really offering us. Yeshua wants you to rip off a huge chunk of the bread of life with him and lather it up with milk and honey and just eat of it until, until you have eaten your full and drink of the nectar of the truth of the word. That's what they want. That's what he wants to share with you. And you're not going to get that at the place that offers the stale wafer. And so I came away like so many people have because the message is, is, uh, is stale. It's stale. It took us, the Reformation was great, but it was arrested at a certain point. And much of what was learned was later re ground was recaptured. Uh, that may be a, a very strange statement, but let's go back a little bit, all right? We talked about the, the fourth century creation of the Greco-Roman church by Constantine primarily at the Council of Nicaea where the Jewish Christian bishops were not invited, right? And so they created the canon and, and the creed of what is now, you know, Gentile Christianity. And um, they, did, they did establish what was orthodoxy, right thinking. And as a result, they also established what was heresy, wrong thinking. And they declared the church of Yeshua HaMashiach, the Messiah, the Messianic Apostolic Church that still existed, was still very strong, at that point, it was the, really the center of Christianity. It was now at Antioch rather than at uh, than Jerusalem. Jerusalem had been razed to the ground. Uh, it was very strong, and it was a pillar of Christianity worldwide. And they declared that to be heretical, and then they began to hunt those congregants to extinction and burn their scriptures. At that point, the 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 church fell into apostasy. There is not any other way to describe it. And the fact that this is not even a footnote in many church histories is what is so amazing about it. You're going to reject the church of Yeshua HaMashiach, of Jesus Christ himself, his own church, and declare it heretical. That's apostasy. And so we are the heritors, the heritors of that apostasy. And it shapes our thinking. It shapes our thinking about our God, right? So what are the things that, 
and, and it has caused changes in Scripture. So what are these changes in Scripture? Well, number one, the name of God has been erased from the Bible despite many, many, many commands not to do so, right? The name of Yeshua HaMashiach has been erased from Scripture, you know, and replaced with the, with the Greek name, right? The, the, the words Torah, meaning instructions, the instructions of God, and often it's translated the law, so it has disappeared from Scripture. The law as we think about it is not really the law as they thought it back then. They were not talking about running red lights. They were talking about you know, disobeying the instructions that God had laid down at Sinai when he made a covenant with the people of Israel. A covenant that they were very clear about was with those people that were there that day and those people that were not there that day. That would be you and I and everyone who wants to walk in covenant with Yehovah, right? Do you want to walk in covenant with Yehovah? Or would you prefer to go walk in covenant with a Greek substitute, right? Many people have been saved within the Gentile churches. That's up to Yehovah and Yeshua. I'm completely fine with whatever they decide, and I know many people that are beautiful people, beautiful spiritual people that have come out of these new churches, right? Um, because, but you, you need to remember that our church, the Messianic Apostolic Church, that's our church. That's the original church. And it goes back to creation. Now, if you want to take the Old Testament and throw it away, along with the God of the Old Testament, who is also the God of the New Testament, well, I don't know a better word for it, but apostasy it certainly is. And basically that's what is done in modern Christianity, is they cherry pick. They cherry pick the, the Old Testament, take what they want, and leave the rest, right? And they justify this by saying, we live under grace, not under the law. The law has been fulfilled, which they are using as a synonym to mean it has been completed, it is no more. Well, I'm sorry, which one of the Ten Commandments are no longer operant? So what, what has been changed in this, in this book? Well, how about the Ten Commandments? You know, how about the one that says you shall not take the, make the name of God not? You shall not make the name of God into nothing. Usually that's translated as in vain. That has pretty much been interpreted out of Scripture when it's very clear in the hundreds of commands Yehovah gives about his sacred name and how to treat it, that it is not to be changed or to made into nothing, and yet we do it because... Our wisdom, our mature spiritual wisdom, obviously is so much superior to that of Yehovah that we, we're going to just change it to fit our new church. That's not the way it works, folks. And if you wish to have the blessings of the truth and the blessings of Yehovah, which are in abundance, you need to be worshiping the right God, not a substitute no matter how many people have been saved under it, they still come away with some really, um, well, they come away with Greek thinking, right? They, they have been saved or they feel like they've been saved, not by a Hebrew Messiah that upholds Torah, which is the case, but by, but by a, a Greek Christ that rejects Torah. These, this is the same historical person, but these two archetypes, these two perceptions of who our Savior is are not the same. They're kind of diametrically opposed in some ways. So this is what is called replacement theology, that we, the Christian, the Gentile Christian church, have become the inheritors of the mantle of the chosen people. What was Israel's is now ours. We are the new Israel, the, the speaking of the church itself, the Gentile Christian church. Because if you'll remember, the Jewish Christians were kicked out at the inception of this church. So the, 
the church of Jesus Christ was no longer wanted. So, you know, you can see for yourself how this could lead to many errors of interpretation in the Bible, one of which is that we don't need this Torah thing that, that Yeshua held to, right? So what did Yeshua say about these things? What did he say about the name of God? Well, he says, I have declared your name unto these apostles that you were given to me, and they have been protected in your name, and I have declared to them your name, and I will declare it, fulfilling the uh, prophecy in Psalms of declaring the name of God in Zion. So he thought the word name of God was important and they were still using it in the first century and it has been totally erased from the New Testament and now the Old Testament. You probably do not have a Bible that even has the correct name of God in it, although we know what it is. So what did Yeshua say about the Torah? Well, remember, that has been interpreted, translated out of the New Testament as well. Uh, Torah is changed to the law. So lawless and lawlessness would be uh, variations of the word Torah, right? So when Yeshua says, in the end, many people will come to me and say, Lord, Lord, have we not healed in your name? Have we not cast out demons in your name? And he says to them, I don't know you. Get away from me, you who do not practice Torah. Now, that is translated as you who practice lawlessness, right? Torah is the law. Those who practice lawlessness are those who do not practice Torah. That's what Yeshua said, or Jesus Christ, if you will. That's what he said about it. And he's not talking about running red lights. He's talking about Torah. You know, he's not talking about law as we think of it today. He is talking about Torah, right? So what has been canceled in Torah? Well, the church has canceled the name of God. They've also changed the Sabbath day from, it's a, and it does say, honor the Sabbath day and keep it holy. And yet in our greater spiritual wisdom, we have decided to change that to Sunday. And the same with the feast days of Yehovah. Now these are not feast days of the Jews. It was not their idea. It was Yehovah's idea to declare them memorials unto all ages. You know, that they do this in, the, in, the, in observance of him. And he promises that if you will come together to observe these feast days that he prescribes, he will come and be there with you. You want to know where God is? Are you searching for God? Join together with your brethren on these feast days and Yehovah will join you because he keeps his promises. But the new Greco-Roman church decided that they were going to have their own feast days. They were going to divorce themselves from the Judaic and Messianic church. So the, the, the Jews, the Jewish priesthood, would have no authority over them. They were creating a new church. And to do so, they needed Greek liturgy, Greek scripture, a Greek God, and a Greek and a Greek Yeshua, a Greek Jesus, and that's what they did. They rewrote the Bible accordingly, and they, and they eliminated the names of the feast days, for example. In the New Testament, um, you know, they call it, uh, Yeshua went up to the Feast of Dedication, right? Well, that's Hanukkah. So in, in the New Testament, in John, uh, Yeshua went and he celebrated that feast day. They celebrated Passover and that's been changed to Easter. It's even been inserted long after the fact. It's been inserted into Acts, you know, a couple of times to validate it, you know, as a, as a valid, uh, be, as being validated in scripture, right? Well, the original Greek text did not have Easter. They had 
a, a pasha, which is uh, which is uh, a Greek word meaning Pesach, which is the Hebrew Passover. So Constantine issued a decree. He issued two decrees basically, but the Easter one was that uh, we it is right for us to do what our reason informs us that we should have nothing to do with the Jews. So we will celebrate the resurrection on the, on the feast day of Easter. Now Easter is a Babylonian sex goddess. I'm sorry, look it up. Okay, so when your church puts on their marquee, come worship Easter with us. All right, just think about the irony of that, right? Uh, but he, he uh, what, what I'm saying is that they were not being coy and trying to hide this. They were totally up front with the fact that they were replacing the feast days of Yehovah with these pagan feast days. You know, made things easier, right? All, all, the, all the heathen were practicing their own feast days, so they just... They just name them Christian. Now they're Christian feast days, and people come, and you can gradually Christianize them. So it makes it easier. It's called religious syncretism. Sync your religion with the old religion, and then just call things by a new name and change it all to a new system. But it, it retains many pagan elements in it, like the Easter egg hunt. You know, this was a... Uh, a ritual of uh, Easter, whose sacred animal was a, a rabbit who who gave who gave birth to Easter eggs. Of course, you know rabbits give live births; they don't actually lay eggs. But uh, you know, Simmeramus, the her her rabbit did, and so then they were dipped in the blood of the sacrifice of of infants, and. Uh, Oh, uh, that's where the the Easter egg, the colored Easter egg ritual comes from. So, your children are out searching for the colored Easter eggs of the the sacrifices of of Easter, uh, and they are the eggs are dipped in the blood. So I know that's not what you are doing. And I understand that, and thankfully it isn't. But it's very clear in Scripture. Do not do what the pagans do to worship their gods and say that you are worshiping me. I think that's a pretty clear commandment, all right? So when we have, when Constantine comes out and say, we're all going to celebrate, you know, the feast day of the birth of, of Yeshua, a new, a new holiday, on the feast day of the sun, the feast day of Sol Invictus, the invincible sun. So um, this, this is a new holiday, the, what we call the Christmas holiday. And so it's laden with all kinds of, of pagan rituals. Uh, to be honest with you, there is no day on the calendar in which it is wrong to worship Yehovah and his son, Yeshua HaMashiach. Uh, however, uh, if you worship on these days, that's a good thing. But if you're going to participate in pagan rituals, you should at least be aware that what you're doing directly violates what Scripture has told you not to do. So what can one do? Are we going to just ruin the fun of Easter? Eh, you don't have to do an Easter egg hunt. You can send your kids on a spirit quest. right? You can buy these little gift boxes instead of eggs. You can get them for uh, pennies, I'm sure, on the internet. Get bags and bags of them in different colors. Little plastic boxes, you know, like little plastic eggs, but they're little plastic boxes. Put a Hershey's Kiss in there and a scripture. They can read the scripture to it or memorize the scripture. Give another Hershey's Kiss. So they're going on a spirit quest that has some connection with learning the word of, of the Lord. Just don't practice. You don't have to take the fun out of these holiday celebrations. Just don't do the pagan rituals. You know, this was very clear in Ezekiel 8, where they were reverting to doing pagan ritual in the temple itself. 
They were doing sunrise services to Easter on the steps of the temple itself. They were weeping for Mithra, you know, in the temple itself. These people, these people had become sucked into the, into the sophisticated Canaanite Baal worship of their ancestors, of the, of the Canaanites, sorry, not their ancestors, the ancestors, but the, the Canaanites in the midst of whom they lived. And most of them went back into the sophisticated worship of these, of, uh, of Baal, really, including, you know, it became, it became the standard thing for most Israelites. And uh, it, this is an important thing for us to understand uh, that Yehovah laid a judgment on these people. You know, in the time of Solomon, Israel was rich. It was rich. He had given them everything he promised. He had given them territory. He had given them prosperity under Solomon that was incredible, it was incredible prosperity. They were strong. They were wealthy. And they turned to other gods. And Yehovah took all of that away from them. He said, because you have forgotten my name for Baal, I'll take it all away at the height of their prosperity, at the height of all the promises he had kept with them. They turned from him to Baal. Because you, as your fathers, have forgotten my name for Baal, I will take all of this away. Israel will be destroyed by the sword, by, by pestilence and by famine. And a third of the population was destroyed in this. And they were taken over by the Babylonians. And the elite of Israel was carried off into slavery. This, is, this was, was Yehovah's judgment on them for going over to Baal worship and, and doing the rituals and doing worshiping, doing the things that pagans did to worship their gods and calling it worshiping him, right? Are you with me on this? So we need to remember that. We don't substitute pagan rituals and say we are worshiping God. Is there a reason? Because you're not worshiping the same God if you're doing that. It's pretty simple. And people need to understand that. And most people will excuse these things by saying, well, okay, I don't use the name of God. All right, maybe I do, you know, maybe there's some pagan ritual involved. Most people are aware now that, that Christmas is actually comes from a pagan time. You know, we're if you're a Messianic, we, you don't have to skip the holiday season. Hanukkah occurs during that same season. It has to do with gift giving. There's, there's no reason, you know, for us, you know, to think it's the Grinch that stole Christmas. No one is trying to ruin people's joy, you know, over the holiday season. Let, let it be. Let it be full. Let it be great. Let it be wonderful. But just don't do the things that pagans do to worship their gods and say you're worshiping Yehovah. Because I'm sorry. You're not. If you're expressly going against his commands, against his Torah, you're not worshiping him. And Yeshua, you're going to find yourself in heaven, and Yeshua may well will say to you, I don't know you. Get away from me, you who do not practice Torah. And um, that's an, that's a, that should chill everyone you know, to the bone. You can't go with an imitation and think that you're going to get the pure blessing, and there are many blessings that, that Yehovah offers us for remembering his name, for remembering the feast days that he asked us to remember as a memorial unto all generations. That means forever, for you that don't know. So these are the feast days of Yehovah, not of the Jews. He gave them to the Jews, and he gave them to us, all those who wish to walk in covenant with them. So you have to honor those things, honor his instructions from, from Mount Sinai, his instructions on how to live. And if you don't do that, then you're just not following the same instruction book uh, to get the blessings that he offers us. 
So can that belief be corrupted? Yes, obvious beliefs can be corrupted. You know, Christians have gone out and done horrible things at times, you know, because, and they believed they were being sincere and righteous and go out and get involved in a pogrom to kill, to kill the Jews or, or others, you know, the, the witch burnings at Salem. Come on, there's, we know these historical things are, are examples of what people can do when those seeds of apostasy, you know, are, uh, you know, are used by Satan to whip people up into, uh, uh, you know, to horror, to horrible acts. Uh, that's the weakness in them, you know. Uh, so people have been saved, and I'm delighted millions of people have been saved in the new churches. We are of the old church. We are of the original church, the original church of the Messiah, the one that goes back to creation because the Heavenly Father is His Father, and He is one with the Heavenly Father. And if we don't even know his name, it says in Scripture, you have magnified your word above all your name. So the most important word in all of Scripture is the name of Jehovah. Most people don't even know what that name is today. And they're, they get involved in all kinds of fetishes associated with the name of God, and um, including translating it into other languages, etc., and so on. So we're missing out on the blessings that Yehovah is offering us for doing, you know, for walking in covenant with Him. Everywhere, the, the, the blessed are those who know the joyful sound of Yehovah. Right? Well, when you translate that, blessed are those who know the joyful sound of the Lord, it completely loses his meaning. You know, he's offering us a blessing just for knowing the pronunciation of his name. Wherever you gather together and remember my name, I will come to you and bless you. You want to find God? Come together with your brethren and remember him in his true name and he will come to you and be with you. So it couldn't be clearer. But if you want to go careening off down a path and we're into modern religion, we're a New Testament church, we throw out everything in the Old Testament. Well, guess what? The Old Testament is 75% of the Bible. The New Testament if you were to take out all of the, uh, the citations from the Old Testament, from, from the Tanakh, or the, the Torah, as the many call it, if you were to take out all of those citations, quotations, and the discussion about them, and the explanation of them, then there might be 10 or 15% left of the New Testament. It's probably about half would be left over. So you're down to about 10% of the Bible that you're ascribing to since you're throwing out the Old Testament. Surely the quotations in the New Testament go too. So th these are the dangers that one is playing with when they want to take replacement theology and say, well, we don't have to listen to anything God said because it's Old Testament. That's all been, that's all been done away with. That's finished. That's completed. That's fulfilled meaning it's finished. So uh, theoretically, that means, of course, you can, you can break any of the commandments because, hey, we live by grace. You know, there are so many people in prisons today that have a, have a, uh, are wearing a crucifix, right? Great religion. You can do anything you want, and all you have to do is go and confess, and you're absolved. It's called cheap grace. Don't expect that you're going to get to heaven by practicing cheap grace. There's a depth, a depth to grace that comes from following God's instructions, right? Following the instructions of Yeshua HaMashiach. And his commandments are the same as those of his followers. And I often read these things in scripture that have been changed. And it, it really takes my breath away at the nerve, the hubris, the pure hubris 
of changing things so blatantly. I mean, it's easy to prove. It's easy to establish. It's not like it's a. It is not like this is in doubt that they have erased the name of God or the name of Yeshua. Our words like Torah, our menorah. You know, Yeshua speaks at the menorah and its use in the household. Didn't know that, did you? Because it's been erased from the New Testament. Because it's the central symbol of Judaism. So when Yeshua says, you do not, you do not light a candle, you do not light your candle to hide it under a bushel, but put it on a menorah so it gives light to all in the house. So he's talking about the use of the menorah for ritual within the household in the first century. Now, the, the rabbis later forbade this as they did the pronunciation of the name of Yehovah. They said, the name is too sacred for you to speak. And uh, <coughs> the menorah is too sacred for you to have in the house, only in the temple. So you see this, this kind of usurpation, gathering all the, the power to themselves that happens in religious establishments of all stripes. The Christians did it as well. You know, the church, you know, uh, during the Middle Ages actually forbade the reading of the New Testament. Most people were illiterate anyway. But just in case you were illiterate, it was forbidden for you to read the Bible. All interpretation had to go through, had to go through the priests. So the actual reading of the Bible was forbidden until the Reformation, of course, when the received text of the word was recovered from those neo-Messianic movements, primarily the Waldensians, who had in, in northern Italy and Spain and various other, and France and various other places, <coughs> because they had spread all over Europe. Once the received text of the word was recovered, it was written up in the vernacular languages, the native language of the various European countries. And the received text of the word spread like wildfire, like it always does throughout Europe. Within 30 years, two thirds of Europe became Protestant within 30 years. Then come the religious wars. <coughs> and after all that carnage is over, came the great ecumenical movement of the 1800s, the 19th century. Well, we're just, we're all going to get together and uh, Protestants and Catholics put the past behind us, all the bloodshed that's all done. We're brothers, brothers in Christ. And we are going to come up with a version of the Bible that is mutually acceptable to both religions, uh, the Protestants and the Catholics. Hey, as far as we're concerned, they're both, uh, they're both new churches. We are the original church. But anyway, the new churches decide they'll come up with a version that was acceptable. The Codex Sinaiticus had just been found in 1854. So this was the oldest existing compilation of the Bible in Greek. Now this is a Catholic Bible. It was one of the copies made by Eusebius as far as we know in the fourth century. Or came from one of those copies. Uh, so using that as their template, they rewrote the Bible, and they made thousands of changes. They made more than 3,000 changes to the text of the Bible, which literally brought it back into the Catholic column. Remember, there's two columns. There's two, two basic streams of the word. The received text, which began with the the, the Hebrew, the Tanakh, the Hebrew Gospels, you know, and uh, then, of course, some of the New Testament was written in Greek and uh, came down and was compiled in the Itala in the middle of the second century, very early 
And that was the first compilation, and it was in Latin. But it came very definitely from the Tanakh and the Hebrew Gospels and Greek manuscripts, but they had, they still had some of the, the original manuscripts of these, of these books at that time. And then about a century or a little more later, about, uh, yeah, a, a little more than a century later, uh, Lucian of Antioch, who was a Hebrew speaker, a, a Jewish Christian, in fact, as far as we know, uh, he was a messianic. He did a compilation from these original sources into Greek. So this Itala and this Greek text of Lucian, which were received with great joy throughout the world of Christendom, right, were used across the map, were hailed, you know, for their spiritual, for their for their quality, the quality of truth, and for their spiritual quality. So they were revered, revered for this. Lucian's Greek Bible and the Itala from which it was developed. So then, only decades later in the fourth century, the Catholic Church decides to come up with their own version. You know, so they, the, the Greek compilation of Eusebius came out about 320. And then about 60 years later, in 380, the Latin compilation by Jerome called the Vulgate. Uh, and of course, the church claims these are the original texts of, of, of the Bible. They were not. You know, the original texts were the received, the line of the received texts of the Bible, the Tanakh, the Hebrew Gospels, uh, and the Greek. The Greek were incorporated into that too, and the Itala, and then later, century later, a little more, uh, the Greek Bible of Lucian of Antioch. These were the original, most authentic texts of the Bible. And of course they survived. It took almost 900 years for the Latin Vulgate to finally be forced upon the people. That's how long the Italic Bible, which was the Bible of the Waldensians, who had fled to northern Italy and retained the received texts of the Bible. And these people, despite persecutions over centuries, vicious persecutions, massacres, one after another, just kept getting pushed further and further back up into the mountains, the Alps. But they carefully preserved and guarded the received text of the Bible. And uh, it was from those manuscripts that the Reformation Bibles were recovered, and many of them, like the French Bible, was uh, of, of Olivetan. He was a Waldensian minister. So these were recovered from Neo-Messianic groups, from the Neo-Messianic Church, the Reformation Bibles. And this is the one that exploded onto the scene during the Reformation and uh, was translated into the vernacular of all the languages of Europe, and which took over Europe, in which two thirds of the of the Europeans became Protestants in in that period of time. So fast forward later to the 1800s, the Reformation was in the 16th century, 1500s, and uh, now we're in the the 19th century, the 1800s. This great ecumenical movement uh, to uh, and they take the Codex Sinaiticus and they rewrite the Bible. And basically, this gets accepted by Protestant churches, but, and the Catholics were delighted, of course, because all these changes had, had, had made it a Catholic version of the Bible for all intents and purposes. So our Bibles, like the 1611 King James Version, which was a Reformation Bible, they were all translated back into basically the Catholic column. And most Protestants don't realize how heavy a layer of Catholicism is the foundation, you know, of their of their faith and doctrine. So part of that is the fact that the Bible has now been returned to the column that comes down through the Catholic Church and is no longer the received text of the Word. And those examples that I've given you are very potent examples of the things that have been changed and taken out of the Bible. The name of God has been removed from the Bible. 
the name of the Messiah has been removed from the Bible. The word Torah and the concept of Torah has been removed and actually vilified as legalism, right? Um, the word menorah has been eliminated from the Bible and, and all its really potent and important symbolism and the name of the feast days have been removed from the Bible and the feast days have been replaced with pagan feast days. So these things have consequences. And if you want to know your true God, then you need to go back to the source, the original fountainhead of the word, which is in the Hebrew Gospels. We can recover the received text of the Bible. There is enough evidence, text of it remaining that we can recompile this. And that is what we are dedicated to do. So, Stay tuned. We'll be back with the next installation on the Hebrew Gospels.